Today, I'm speaking with Belle Clark. Belle, thank you so much for joining me today. Of course. Thank you for having me. I'm happy to be here. Yeah, we've been trying to get together here for a while, so I appreciate your patience and glad it worked out. I do have a few things I know about you, so I'll give a brief bio and then I'll pass it to you to tell us a little bit more about yourself. I know Belle is from a small town in Ohio, and she's currently living life in a small town in Indiana, so small towns there. Do you like yeah. living in a small town, by the way? Um, I'm, I I know there's benefits to it. Um, it's very safe. Um, you know a lot of people. You get comfortable with the people you're around, um, but definitely want to experience more of America, more diverse, more open areas. Yeah. I'm, I'm just the... Um, Flip flop. I grew up right outside of Philadelphia, and I want I want to live in the mountains near uh, with my nearest neighbor ten miles away. Yeah. So, and Bella is working toward a degree in English with a focus in creative writing. That's awesome. And she grooms dogs. She has two dogs of her own, which you can tell us about in a second. And she delivers pizza. And Bella and her fiance Ross love to travel. Uh, they remain in a constant awe of life. Uh, she's a huge learner, and so she's often at home with a stash of books, podcast episodes, and coffee mugs. And she loves deep converse, deep conversations, especially focused on humanity. And is it correct? You're a blogger? Yes, I am. I just released um, my new blog last night, actually. Awesome. What is it titled? Um, it's titled Pulpit Peace. Nice. Very cool. So we'll have, I'll get the link for that and I'll put it beneath our video. So check that out when you're done listening to our interview. And what else should we know about you? Um, so yeah, like you mentioned, um, I just released a blog. I've, I'm a huge creative writer. Um, I think when I, before I really stumbled across Christianity while I was Christian and now deconstructing, it's always been, um, a core aspect of me. Um, I tend to write to escape things, to heal from things, to process things. And I really love being in a place where I can inspire and help others. Um, so that's, that's probably the biggest part of me, honestly. That's awesome. Uh, one thing I've about writing on this ad, I've I've been amazed at the technology to do speech to text, and boy, that would have helped so much when I was in college. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> do all the all the writing you have to do, but, of course. <laughs> and what's your next uh, big trip, or at least the trip you'd like to take when you have time and money? Oh well, we're going to Boston for my fiance's birthday in November, so that's gonna be a big one. Um, we are also eloping um, in May this coming up year. Um, we're going to Maui, Hawaii for that, so I'm super pumped for that. Very nice, very nice. Yeah. That's awesome. You say when you're in Boston, check in with the Cheers Cheers Bar there if you know that show. <laughs> oh, I don't. What's that show from? Oh, you don't know Cheers? Mm -mm. Sometimes you wanna go where everybody knows your name. No. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I will have to send you some clips. <laughs> cheers is a classic. The great. Okay. Cheers. I got you to sing though. So yeah, uh, <laughs> that's probably a bad thing. Uh, but anyway, <laughs> I would love to hear your story. I know you've, you've, um, some of the, from some of the notes I saw, some of your story, um, does coincide with some of the things I would have experienced. So I'm sure some of the stuff I'll relate to, but I know, um, that you have some uniquenesses too. So I'd love to hear, you know, how your, how your story went. Of course. Yeah. So um, I actually, my story might be a little different from some in that I wasn't raised um, as a Christian. I didn't have, you know, typical practicing Christian parents. Um, there were some memories I might have of me going to church as a child, but nothing too serious. When I um, was 15 years old, I actually, um, about that time I was a teenager and I had some friends that was actually attending um, this, like this youth ministry group that was um, advertised at our high school or our middle school. Um, and it was called Youth for Christ, um, that organization. And they their mission is to really to reach lost middle schoolers, to reach lost kids. Um, and so at that age, at 15, um, I currently was in a pretty rough home life. Um, and I felt like my needs, um, I would say the best way to describe it, I was neglected in a way, um, definitely emotional. Um, so I think at that age, I didn't really have a good experience of um, love and acceptance and care. Um, so at that time, I kind of coped with that by having a good amount of friends and um, try to find myself belonging with my friend groups and finding acceptance from them. So, of course, when these friends are like, hey, we're going to this Monday night youth group, um, you know, there's going to be pizza and pop. I was like, oh, yeah, totally. That sounds fun. Um, so I started going and, you know, I didn't think much of it. I, I remember thinking it might be a little silly. I was 15 and I felt like I was also in that rebellious stage of life, you know, where I'm like, OK, parents are stupid. You know, school doesn't matter that much. I, I don't know. Just some kind of, I guess, um, 
that age before you start to really <laughs> mature and stuff. And you're just kind of figuring life out in a genuine way. Um, but yeah, so I surrounded myself with those friends and they encouraged me to go to check out Youth for Christ. And, um, you know, I didn't mind. I went and even going, I really didn't mind too much. But um, I remember for the first time hearing these promises of unconditional love and acceptance and care. And um, one of the biggest things that I remember learning there was how God knows us and he knows us. There's a Bible verse where he knows he can count all the hairs on our head and looking, you know, hearing that I was like, okay, what? Like, that I was attracted to that. I was attracted to the idea that there was someone or something out there that knew me, you know, so deeply, knew me very well. And not only knew me, but because they knew me so well, because God knew me so well, he loved me and he accepted me for everything I was. And he cared about me and he wanted me to be safe, to be happy, to be cared for. And of course, as a vulnerable 15-year-old girl in a very rough home life that didn't get that from her parents, um, especially her father, um, that I was instantly drawn to that. And I instantly wanted that. And so I started to, I've always been a learner, like you mentioned in my um, introduction. I'm a huge question asker. Um, I love to read. Um, so I just remember even bringing this notebook and I jotted down these questions that were like kind of keeping me from God or keeping me from the Christian faith. And I was like, I need to get these answered before I can really make a decision. Um, so I, you know, just walking into the youth for Christ um, ministry night with this notebook and I hand it to like the leader of the group or whatever. He's like this very intelligent man, um, very religious. And I'm like, can you please answer these for me? We need to get to the bottom of this, you know? And um, I really want to understand more of what your faith is and how, you know, why should I join, you know, I, I need answers to some of these questions. And if I remember, most of them were just, you know, how is God created? You know, who is Jesus really? Um, why does he want something to do with me? Why does bad stuff happen? Why, why is my home life rough? Things like that, you know, questions that matter, you know, that I think are, um, you know, if you're asking those questions, that shows that you are trying to learn. And I, I definitely was trying to learn about God. So, um, can Thankfully, I ask you a couple of questions? Of course, absolutely. Were, did you did you have friends at that point who had yet invited you to trust Christ? Like directly said, Bell, do you want to trust Christ? Or was this or was it purely just like very vague at this point in terms of an actual invitation? I would say it's vague from my memory. Um, these friends were just really there to just hang out and have fun with everybody else, just a bunch of kids our age. Um, I think I was actually probably one of the first friends that um took it, started taking it seriously or wanting to learn more. Mm -hmm. so. Had you heard any of the, say, Christmas stories about, you know, Jesus being born in, in Bethlehem? And did you know kind of the general background of Christianity? Um, I would say some of the Christmas stories um, I might have learned about. Um, like I said, those brief memories I have as a child going to church, um, you know, we were probably that family that attended on Christmas, especially and Thanksgiving. Um did you see the so, Charlie Brown Christmas special? No, but I hear okay. that's like a classic too. I guess I don't know the classic. <laughs> <laughs> yep. I need to start doing research. <laughs> um, but in, in yeah. a sense, it's a classic when you're a Christian. When you're not a Christian, you're like, this is indoctrination. Oh, anyway. goodness. I know another classic that I never related to was VB, uh, not VBS, Veggie Tales. Yeah. Like Veggie Tales was such a huge thing for those who were like, um, grew up as a Christian. And I just never really had experience with that. Yeah. Well, you're, you're, you're definitely not missing too much. It's, I mean, it's, it's, <laughs> it's, 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 it's different to hear someone talk about not being indoctrinated as a young child, because for a lot of people, even the questions that you're mentioning, that you're asking your, your leaders there at the, at the youth for Christ and so forth, those questions should be asked. Like, where did God come from? Who is Jesus really there? Those and many other questions are so critical, but when you grow up in it, you just know that you know that you know the right answer is what the Bible says. So at this point, what the Bible is not necessarily an authority in your life. Is that fair to say? Um, at that point in my life, no. It was a definitely a time of curiosity. Um, and I will mention as well, because I've gotten that question before when I've wrote about my experiences joining Christianity at a later age than most, um, not being conditioned as a child. 
people will, you know, ask me like, what made you join? What made you want to join? You know, especially at an, at a, as a teenager, you know, that's, it's usually the other way around. I think, you know, usually tend to rebel against sort, certain things or, you know, um, make your own decisions. And I would say it was absolutely my decision and my curiosity and my questioning. And I really now can look at that and see that that's because of my home life and my relationship with my parents, um, with, you know, even just my mom being deaf, my dad also had, um, he was hearing impaired, so he wrote a hearing aid. So I was already used to being in this position as the second child, the oldest daughter, I was used to being in this position of helping them. And I would interpret for them if they didn't have interpreters, or I would explain even letters to them. I would read them and like explain it to them, even as a 12 year old. So I was already used to being in that position of almost being the parent in my family, you know, helping with my younger siblings. And so when it came to Christianity, this was this brand new thing that was not in my family. And, you know, as a 15 year old, I looked at my family in my life and I said, you know, we were all hurting and, you know, it's, it's so toxic. It's so dysfunctional. I'm like, what can I almost look for a solution for it? And I attend this ministry night and I'm like, okay, this is unconditional love and acceptance. And you know, Christians seem to have it figured out. They seem to be good people. So I want to take this to my family and my parents, and I want to save them. That was what my mission almost became. Like, I want to save my family. And mm-hmm. I see that now it, it's deeper than that. It's I want to be safe. I want mm-hmm. to be safe as a child. I want to be safe as a teenager. Mm-hmm. Um, so, and that that's just a basic human need is safety, um, whether that's physical, emotional safety, mental safety, all of the, all of the above. Um, I didn't have that in my yeah. home. And so I was seeking that already and Christianity seemed to offer that. I promised to offer that. And so I truly, um, looking back now, I see that that's why I was so attracted and so led to it. And in a sense, you could say that there was a vulnerability factor going on too, where you, I mean, if, if you'd been in a different, in a different country and it had been a different religion, you know, that sent a similar message of safety, maybe they would have gotten to you first, but you, you know, that the, the word I like to use a lot is praying, like P-R-E-Y, praying on people's vulnerabilities mm-hmm. to say, you know, you, you have some, some real needs. And then, you know, when you hear the preacher saying there's a God shaped hole in your heart, you know, and God wants to fill it boy, that that'll preach and it hits home. Absolutely. Yeah. I, um, when I write about Christianity and how toxic it can be, the biggest point that I always come back to is how they reach you, how they try to save you or convert you. And the first, and I knew this because I would help, I was called like a soul winner. Like I would help knock on doors when I was involved in the Baptist church. And I would um, have this sense of responsibility to go to my public high school and encourage others to come to church. And I would, you know, beg and beg to my parents and my family to go to church. Like I was this on fire, soul winning witness, you know, and I was young and I was fiery and passionate and, you know, people were attracted to that. And so I really, um, see now that I learned in that position, I learned that the easiest way to reach people, um, is to find the most vulnerable and the most needy almost, you know, um, cause they're, I think they worded it as like, they're going to be the most receptive, the most open. Um, But the, the biggest core issue I see with Christianity is how they reach you. And I see that as they start by condemning you, judging you. They talk about how sinful you are, how you are inherently bad and wicked and evil. You're born into sin and they start you know, even rattling off examples, like, are you an alcoholic? You know, do you have sex, you know, before marriage? Um, Do you lie? Do you steal? Um, All of these things. And, you know, they say, look at that. You're so sinful. You're so bad. And, you know, now you can be saved. You can be washed of that. And, you know, what you need to do now is call in the name of Jesus and ask him to forgive you of all of your sins and to, um, come into your life, come into your heart as your Lord and savior, and he will save you and you can have a new life. Yeah, exactly. And that is just looking at that. That's like you said, I would use the word pray P R E Y. I would say that's predatory because it's, it's 
knocking you down and stripping you of everything, everything good that you are, because I believe people are good. And it's showcasing you as this terrible, terrible, wicked person in desperate need of saving. And then they, within a split second after that, they're like, oh, hey, we have this. This is what we have. This is your antidote, your medicine, your solution. It's Jesus. You know, this is your easy way out, your easy fix. Yeah. I think it was Dan Barker or, or someone like that said something to the effect of like, what kind of doctor is it who cuts you and then tries to sell you a Band-Aid? It's yeah. like, that's the, they're, they're doing that. They're, they're creating the problem, which is not, is not real. They're mm-hmm. making it seem like there's a problem and then giving you the solution. And yeah, it's, I think especially too, when you look at how many people really do go through tough things in life where like, for example, I used to do a lot of preaching at a soup kitchen and Everybody knew when they'd shuffle in that you had to sit there for 30 to 45 minutes and listen to the preacher, you know, many times me, talk about the gospel. And that if you wanted your dinner, you, you know, you had to sit there and listen. Yeah. And so I'd give the gospel and then they'd, they'd get their dinner. Um, mm. But these are people that are desperate. They have nowhere to go. You know, they're going to be probably living on the streets that night. And in that context, I, I kind of have a captive audience. Like, where else are you going to go? You got no options. And that's, it's, it's a sickness that we, we put on our, on, our, on other people to feel, I guess, in part, like we're powerful. We feel special. Like we're the ones delivering this wonderful message and we can rescue you, but it's, it's, it's really sick. It's really sick. So as you're, you're at this point going to youth for Christ, was there at, at some point, like some answers that were coming to your questions? I know you said you had questions that were keeping you from moving forward. How, how long did it take for you to get to a point where some of the questions were answered to a point where you were like, yeah, this makes a lot of sense. Um, I wouldn't say that it took too long, terribly long, um, simply because I had this, you know, I'd, I'd go to this youth ministry and they actually attempted to answer some of my questions about life, about myself, about my family and home. And, and then I'd go home and have a lack of that, have a lack of conversation. And um, it's almost like, like you mentioned, I was vulnerable and really just open. It's almost like open to trying anything, you know, like, okay, well, let's, let's give this a try because I need something to feel better, to be safe. And um, I felt like he definitely answered his questions, the answers I had, the questions I had with um, a biblical basis. Um, you know, I know the questions specifically where I asked, um, why is there bad in the world? Why, why, um, is my home life so bad? You know, his ex- answer to that was there's so much sin in the world and the world's a broken world and it's in desperate need of saving. People are in desperate need of saving. I'm um, kind of like we talked about. And um, he said, the only answer to this is Jesus. So, you know, of course, if I'm already in that place of I need to bring the solution to my parents, my family, I was definitely on, on board, you know, I'm like, okay. And I remember that same year when I was 15, um, I was by myself, actually. Um, I was like taking this walk. I remember like um, a few blocks from my parents' house, there's like this like reservoir, like a small pond. And I would always go out there and just like um, read or just, it was like my, my peace, I guess, my safe place. And I just kind of went out there and I just sit and talk. I don't even remember like folding my hands because I was like, yeah don't need to. I just kind of talked like he was just there. Like they, they taught me like, like you were talking to God. <laughs> mm-hmm. yep. Yeah. Um, I remember vividly like being taught. He's just your best friend. Like he's just there. Um, you don't need to, um, be formal in any way. You don't need to be professional. Just talk to him. He's just right there. He's always there. So, you know, I was all over that and was like, okay. You know, and I'm, I remember that night, that day, being by myself and asking like, Jesus, will you please come into my heart and save me? And I remember even saying like, I recognize that I'm a sinner and that I've sinned in the eyes of God. And, um, I recognize that, um, I need to call on the name of Jesus and ask him to come into my heart and be my Lord and savior. Um, and I want that, you know, I accept the gospel and I want to be changed. I want to have new life and I want to, um, you know, be that child of God. And I want to be a follower of Jesus. And, um, so when that happened, um, you know, that I remember feeling very, very good because I was like, okay, now things are going to change. Um, what age was that again? 15, 15. Okay. Yeah. 15. Um, and it was kind of coincidental that 
of course, at the time I was like, it's a work of God, but it's coincidental that later that year, um, I think that would have been like November, 2015, I was still 15. Um, we had a Baptist church that um, was in Toledo, Ohio, and they were actually in our small town in Ohio, um, door knocking. And their, their time, that was, I guess, a month before Christmas, they were actually knocking and asking for like cans and stuff, like a food pantry um, to help feed people for Christmas. Um, and then they would ask, um, after they would ask for um, any help with that, they would ask if we had any prayer requests. And my dad actually answered the door and, you know, he's like yelling at me, like, go grab some cans from the, you know, pantry. And I was like, okay, going through our expired food cans, <laughs> throwing them in a bag. <laughs> I'm like, they can have this, these spaghettios and this ravioli because I don't want to have it. Um, and so he, I remember walking back up there with all these expired cans and my dad's just like, yeah, can you pray that, you know, I can go get a job and we can, um, you know, have more money so I can feed my kids and things like that. And um, I remember forking over all the cans to the, the, it was the preacher at the time I was talking to my dad and, and that preacher just latched on to that prayer request. And he immediately started talking to my dad about, you know, um, how Jesus can offer so much for him and all of these things. And it was good timing because after I had been saved by myself, I spent those last, um, those next months just witnessing and witnessing to my dad and my mom and my siblings, but mainly my dad, because um, my dad was definitely um, a narcissist and an abuser in some ways. Um, And so I knew that he was the main cause of our um, family dysfunction and our problems. And not only that, but my dad um, was unemployed for a long time and um, he hurt his back um, with this factory job he had, but that was when I was like 10. And he got um, back surgery and he was okay, but he just never went back to work after that. Um, And so we were living on government benefits and um, really struggling because we, that was a six person family, two parents and four kids. And um, my two younger siblings, I think my youngest sibling at that time when I was 15 would have been like six, seven, like we were, we were still pretty young. Um, definitely had a lot of needs that weren't being met um, with the finances and then with my dad's um, inability to be there for us. Um, and so mm-hmm. I was interesting you know, to hear his background. Well, like what brought him to, to be who he was. Um, it's very interesting, actually, um, that I will point out my dad's my grandpa, my dad's dad is actually a preacher now. Hmm or was, um, and he had like this, he lived most of his adult life being like, he considered lost, um, how he explained to me. And um, he went through a divorce and then um, basically worked all the time and then became a Christian. And um, my dad said he remembers being a teen, a high schooler and watching his dad just completely change into this very strict traditional person. And it was like almost the opposite of what it used to be. And um, so my dad has some experience with his own dad preaching at him, preaching to him. And my dad would recount memories of how he's like, the only time I spent with my dad was going to the grocery store, going to church. And he never had an option in that. He never got to say he didn't want to go to church. He just went to church. And um, so I knew my dad had some background knowledge of the Bible and of God, but I also knew he had some of that bad experience. So, um, you know, 15 year old Bell, I'm like, I'm going to take the approach that I received, which is loving and care and acceptance. And so I'm just, you know, witnessing, witnessing, witnessing my dad. And I really noticed that it was helping in a way, you know, he was actually actively listening to me asking questions. And so when this preacher knocked on our door and talked to my dad about his prayer request, had that one-on-one connection and interaction, I really noticed my dad, you know, um, connect to that. And I was over the moon, of course. Um, And so then that started um, us attending that church. Um, It was an independent fundamentalist Baptist church, a very traditional, very legalistic, um, which means when looking at the Bible, they only believed in the KJV version, the King James version, which is like the fun words like thy, thou. (laughs) Nice. nice. Yeah. (laughs) So you got thrown into the deep end of Christianity. Wow. You got, you went right from the, uh, Kitty pull into the 12 foot side of it. That's, crazy. That's how I felt. Yeah. I felt like I was in this, I started in this very uh, modern, almost liberal, like um, geared for teenagers sort of faith 
belief system. And then I kind of just got immersed into this, you know, almost an extreme Baptist church. And um, as a teenager too. Did you recall, like, do you recall any of the sermons or at least the tone of them? Was there any kind of fire and brimstone? Absolutely. Uh, they yeah. actually use those terms too. Um, they would describe hell as fiery brimstone place. And they would say it's a place of torture and fire forever. Um, they would even say like souls are weeping down there. It was very extreme. The talk of hell, um, the talk of how they talked about sinners and sin in general. Um, there was recounting the sermons I sat through and listened to. I always felt this extreme um, tone, this, this harsh tone, almost this, almost this tone of hatred. Yeah. Did you ever see that Disney movie, Pollyanna? No. Oh, I've got a, all these shows. I got to get you, but there's the a character. The the pastor is exactly what you're describing. I think it's more like a Presbyterian church, but uh, just you know, he spends three quarters of the movie being, you know, God is going to come and get you when you don't, when you least expect it. He's out to get you for your sins, and the the little girl that's got a sweet personality makes him realize just how nasty that is, and he eventually, at the very end, preaches a message of of kindness. But it's this it's is sad. a Disney movie. What was that? This is a Disney movie. Yeah, it's an older one called Pollyanna. Wow, I'm going to check that out. Yeah, I love that. I appreciate Disney so much. <laughs> yeah, and hey, St Star Wars, some good stuff coming out there. What, what, with your dad, I did want to clarify. At what point did he like? I'm assuming he he became a Christian too. How long after you became a Christian did he follow suit? Um, I I couldn't give you a timeline for sure, but it was definitely shortly after. I remember he was the first person in my family I really was able to reach okay. with that. Um, I actually was successful in witnessing to everyone in my family except my mom. <laughs> gotcha. So, um, so she never came to Christ. No, um, with her being deaf, I actually um, had she had a family friend that was um, a sign language interpreter, and I got involved with a ministry called um, Deaf Teen Quest, which mm -hmm. reaches those who may be lost that are deaf or hearing impaired. And of course I had, I knew sign language and I had my mom in mind. So I, I um, was involved with that for a little bit. And I even had this storybook Bible almost laid out like a comic book and it was geared for the deaf. So they could see the pictures and read the words and um, it was very accessible to them. And I remember having that book and I literally would approach my mom and be like, you want to read through this with me and everything. And she just was, she was pretty resistance with resistant with it. And it was frustrating and it was also hurtful hmm. when you heard the messages of hell did that become part of your impetus that she is destined for um a flames of hell if, if she didn't oh, turn yes my goodness that was i would say my main motivator um okay. which i i know now that fear is the main motivator behind christianity and that fear was definitely instilled in me i felt more fear for those i love than for myself um because then sermons, I was constantly reassured that if I was saved, which I was, and I was constantly repenting, which I was constantly connected to God through prayer and um, going to church and studying my Bible, I would go to heaven. Everything was okay. So I didn't, I wasn't scared of that, but I was scared of my mom, you know, for my mom. And I was scared of my dad, even if he would fall behind or, you know, um, backslide. I was scared for my siblings. I was scared for my friends. I, I was scared for random strangers on the street that I didn't even know. Mm. But it was so drilled into me that it was my mission to save them from the way they described hell. It was like, I don't even want my enemy to go there. Yeah. Yeah. I remember um, what you're describing is, it reminds me of something I used to do when I was a Christian as a teenager, and I'd been a Christian from like, um, I don't know, five or so years old and to recommitted my life when I was, you know, a young teenager. So it was just part of my worldview and my psyche. But I remember very much thinking uh, two big, two big things relating to what you're saying. I always wanted to see people for who they really were, mm -hmm. meaning I wanted to see them as the, the sinner that they, that they were in a predicament before God. And so, for example, as a young man, of course, you would be tempted to look at a beautiful woman and your eyes would wander and so forth. And I'd always train myself to think, yeah, but if you, that's not the real her. The real her isn't this beautiful woman. The real her is a heart of sin. And I would train myself to kind of 
you know, like you guys, you know, would joke about, you know, disrobing, you know, a girl taking her, her clothes off in your, in your mind. I wasn't doing that as much as I was taking her skin off and her, I was, look, I was looking, taking her bones off. I was looking at her heart. I was like, it's like, as if you could say, if you were a real person, you like, if you were, if you were really who you are on the inside and it's shown, you would either be an angel. If you're obviously a good person, you'd be like this wonderful person that's just glowing bright, or you'd be this monster that would pop out. Mm-hmm. And I'd always be thinking to myself, these people are monsters inside because of the sin. Mm-hmm. And it would teach it would teach me to to kind of stay away from the whole lust issue because I was like, that girl that looks so beautiful, she might be a, a sinful monster inside. Like see her for who she really is. And then the corresponding side was which relates to what you're saying, is I would also see people, I try to imagine people like just like you might see um someone do these days in a movie with special effects see them on fire, um, you know, see somebody literally in the flames burning. And so I would just, you know, kind of people become people watchers. I would just sit, you know, in a mall or something and I'd watch people go by and I'd imagine in my mind that they're on fire. And it got to the point where in my mind at that time, it was a good thing because it made me think that reality is the ultimate reality. They are sinful. This isn't a handsome guy, a beautiful woman walking around. <clears throat> I mean, it's a monster. It's a monster that has a sin problem and their destiny is what I'm imagining the flames of hell. And so it keeps you on track of saying, don't worry about the football game on Sunday. Don't worry about what you want to buy. Worry about their soul. You know, that's, that's the reality of what's going on here. Yeah. 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 It's, it's no life to, to spend every single day worrying about souls worrying about an afterlife, you know, what happens when you die and when everyone else dies, you know, things you don't even have control over. And it's like, that that's no life. That's no life to live. It's miserable. And yeah. it's, it's full of fear and shame and guilt. That is not yours. You don't deserve to have it. Yeah. Did you feel guilty for anyone that you ever heard that maybe you, you could have done more, you could have shared the gospel one more time or clear and they ended up dying. And you, for all you knew, they were not saved and was there a guilt factor that you could have done more? Gosh, yes. I had, um, I can know, I know three people off the top of my head that actually um, died by suicide um, that, you know, a, a sister of a friend I had before I was Christian um, that did. And I thought about her five years after she passed and was like, oh gosh, you know, and then I had two friends um, that did um, pass away by suicide when I was Christian. And I remember one of them actually being um, a longtime friend and we stopped talking because I grew into my faith and they were a firm atheist. (laughs) Just thinking about that now, you know, I know that I beat myself up so harshly for that. And even though I tried to talk to them about God, it's like their death impacted me and it wasn't me grieving the loss of a beautiful human being. It was me feeling guilt and shame because for some reason I'm responsible of their af- for their afterlife, for where they're going to belong after they die, which is all a lie. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, when you're in it, if you think it's real, soul winning is obviously in one sense the best life, but the issue is that they never give you enough information for you to determine whether or not this is all mythology. Mm-hmm. And once you realize it is mythology, you're like, okay, so soul winning isn't actually a thing. I'm not actually saving anybody. I'm just perpetuating an ancient mythology. But when you're in it though, it does, it does feel like something you can be proud of. It's like their very best life to me growing up was, was some kind of, you know, ministry or a position where you could be doing that on a regular basis. And obviously trying not just professionally to be preaching the gospel, but you know, with the grocery store or what have you, did you ever give out tracks? I did. Yeah. Yeah. Oh my gosh. And I remember the year I started deconstructing, I had one left on my car. That left me in a trigger all day long. And I was like, it's coming back to bite me. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. So your your dad, in your going back to your story, your dad got saved. Was it just like months later or years later after you did? Oh, shortly, like months after, definitely. Okay. Mm-hmm. What happened next in your kind of family dynamic? Yeah. So, well, we started attending that church. Um, it was a further drive. And like I said, we didn't have the greatest finances. So they actually started a Thursday night Bible study in our hometown at my high school. And so we would go to that and it started off with, you know, my dad going, me going, and basically encouraging the whole family to go. And we would all go, my mom would go too. 
And um, it then uh, I got baptized and I went to the original church to get baptized. So I got baptized there um, in this like little shallow pool. Um, and I just really, the passionate side of me, which I now know is a core aspect of me is my passion. They took that and ran with it. You know, I was considered, especially for my age, I was considered a fiery Christian, you know, always on fire for God, very fervent, you know, very, um, you know, with the soul winning, with writing about God, writing about my faith, um, with talking, you know, the conversations I had, attending church, reading my Bible, praying. And the thing I really wanted to make sure I said in this interview as well is um, when I first started deconstructing, I did have Christians tell me that I was never a true believer or I um, must have not had a relationship with Jesus if I could just leave like this. And I must have been just been doing it for show, just following the rules, following a religion, but I didn't really have a relationship. And that is further, that it couldn't be further from the truth because I was the one that would say to myself, to others, this is not a religion to me. It's a relationship. You know, that was the, the biggest belief I had about Jesus was I am in this close connected relationship with Jesus and he is my best friend. You know, he's not just my savior. He's my best friend. He follows me everywhere. He's with me everywhere. And, um, you know, going back to the basic beliefs I had, he loves me, cares about me. He knows me. Um, it was this very like kind and loving relationship. And this view I had of Jesus was, was simply that, um, and with, you know, my faith, all of those things I did, um, I learned in church that we, they would say, we do good works because we love God. We don't do them to get into heaven. We don't do them to be the best Christian. We do them because we love God. Um, so that made complete sense to me. So yes, I was on fire for God. Yes, I did everything by the book. I did all the rules. You know, I was a I, I won three trophies for Bible quizzing. I, I was, I was big into it. I had my own Christian blog. You know, I, I did everything under the sun for God, but at the end of the day, it was my personal relationship with Jesus that motivated all of that. And I really felt like I was doing everything just out of pure love in my heart for God, for Jesus that I grew to know. Um, Can you tell us about Bible quizzing, by the way? Yeah, absolutely. So that was actually a funny story with this too. That was um, actually like a tangent thing with Youth for Christ. Um, it wasn't involved with my Baptist church. So we studied the um, ESV version, the English Standard Version of the Bible. Um, and each year we would do like a different book. Um, some years we did a collection of books like in the New Testament. Um, I know one year we did Genesis. One year we studied um, like Philippians, um, Corinthians, you know, like a collection. Um, but my Bible quizzing team, um, we weren't the greatest, but I in my team was, I was really good. Um, and that's not like bragging, obviously, but like I would be in the top 20, like every year I would get a trophy and um, I would try to lead our team. Um, I actually encouraged my sister to join Bible quizzing as well as a way to um, help her come closer to Christ. Um, and that really helped me study my Bible. Um, of course, you know, studying to do well in these quizzing matches. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with like quizzing, but there's this oh, yeah. option where you can contest an answer or question. Um, so if the judge asked a question and somebody buzzed in and answered it and I'm like, that's not right. Or I would word that differently. I was that annoying kid that would contest like challenging answers. I would be like, can I please contest? And I would say, you know, this, this should not be awarded that point because this is what the Bible actually says. And in order to be that way, I really had to study my Bible and Absolutely. I grew to really love it. And um, if you look at the Bible I had, it was like so tattered, so highlighted, sticky notes everywhere. I wrote pen in it. Um, I had written down promises to God and like the cover of it. Like it, it was well loved. <laughs> Do you, did you ever hear that um, phrase? The Bible that's falling apart usually belongs to the person who isn't. Oh my gosh, yes. <laughs> it's something like that, yeah. It's like the cheesiest Christian quote, but yeah, it's definitely yeah. out there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's it's I, I did Bible quizzing myself with um mostly Mennonites. 
And um, it was, it was interesting. It was, it was crazy because what you're alluding to, and, and my experience is the same thing where you're, you're in the words so much and you're doing it in a sense for academics, but you're also doing it because you love it. Like you love to get in the word. And I remember, um, I'm sure it sounds like you'd probably um, feel similarly, but when, when you're in it, it wasn't like a chore. It was like, this is the word of God. This is, you know, taste and see that the Lord is good and mm -hmm. you want more of it. So, you know, if someone said, Hey, I want you to read a chapter, you know, the old Testament and new Testament a day for, for, you know, your devotions, I would want to read 10 of each and be like, I couldn't get enough. And this was God's love letter to us. Of and course. it was instructions for how to obviously like avoid making poor choices and to make good choices. But it was about connecting with our savior and, and re, programming our minds to think like Christ, you know, let the, the mind of Christ uh, be, be taking over your earthly mind. And you, we mm. knew, you know, that that was, that was not natural. You had to have the spirit do it to you through the word. And the more you got in the word, the more it could, you know, it was like the spirit needed tools. It's like a carpenter who needs a lot of, you know, nails and, ha you know, hammer and screws and all that. If they have no no nails then they can't do too much you know but once you have a lot of the supplies you need you can build things and it was like the spirit is ready to work on you but there needs to be this this existing sense of being in the word as much as you can just go to the word go to the word and for people to turn around at people like you who i'm sure you feel the same way and me and and say you weren't really in this it's just like what else could i say i mean Mm -hmm. Jesus was everything. The Bible was everything. And it was, I mean, there was a first thought of, of the morning was, God, how do I most glorify you today? And the last thought of the day was, God, please, you know, use whatever I did to plant seeds for the kingdom. Please use it, bring it to fruition, bring people to, to a saving knowledge of Christ through the gospel. Like that's what drove people like us. Mm -hmm. And it it really is weird when you think about it, but did it, as you deconstructed, did it ever like did that dynamic that people would accuse you of that stuff, did that in any way help you to realize that that worldview was def just devoid of, of some sense of truth in the sense that like it's, it's unquestionable, the, like the exclusivity of it. Like it's the gospel is the truth. The Bible is the truth. Jesus is God. He's our son. He's, he's a son of God. He's a savior and Lord. But the fact that they don't ever allow any other option like, you know, if you don't agree with that, you're dead wrong. And if you leave, you were never really in it because if, if you were in it, you can't, like, you can't leave. You're like, there's no, there's no option to be in the club and get back out. You're either in the club or you've been a fraudster. Your, your get in the club card was not actually, le you know, legitimate. Did, did that dynamic of seeing that that's how Christians see things help you at all to understand what was going on? Oh, absolutely. I just want to mention that you you stated a lot of great points there, too. Um, a lot of truth in that is, you know, lots of things that I heard as well and believed as well, um, especially when it comes to the Bible and studying it. Um, but yeah, absolutely. The, the beginning of my deconstruction was the hardest part of my life, really. Um, it was filled with a lot of guilt, a lot of shame, a lot of sadness. Um, and I, you know, that comes from completely losing your identity because it's it becomes completely rooted in Christ in your faith. So losing that alone is terrifying. And then getting backlash from Christians that you went to church next to, or you became good friends with. And, you know, I would have people tell me like, you know, you, you don't fall into the black side. Don't let Satan get you. Or, you know, you're, I actually had some people too that knew how strong I was in my faith that they would literally say, I know that God still has a purpose and a plan for you. And this is just a dry season right now. Like, like I can't wait for you to get back on it and can, you know, keep writing and talking about Jesus. Like you're going to get through this. Like it was like, they couldn't even give up the fact that I lost belief because it would, you know, I had people reach out to me privately in messages because I have a, I have a pretty good social media presence. And I did when I was Christian, and I had people text me privately and they were like, Belle, like you were one of the biggest reasons I was able to keep my faith. Like you're mm -hmm. writing, you talking about it, you answering some of the questions I had. And they were like, if you lose your belief, like it was wild to them. Cause it's like, what do they have now? Like, cause I was a huge inspiration for a lot of people, 
So I felt a lot of guilt and shame from that. Um, but it took me time to heal from that and learn that once again, it's a core part of me to be passionate, to be inspirational, to write, to be kind, um, to crave connection with other people. So now I just see, um, Christianity doesn't get that anymore. It doesn't get to have that. Um, that's yeah. mine to define. It's, it's, I, I never really consented to the extremes that the Baptist church especially took it. Um, mm-hmm. and now, it. yeah, absolutely. So, um, that's how I see it now. And that's, what's really helped me heal. And, you know, I've really just seen a multitude of the Christians that I knew start to deconstruct as well. And I'm probably one of the first people they reach out to. Mm-hmm. That's yeah. awesome. Mm-hmm. Well, I know I sidetracked a little bit with my, my questions there, but in terms of going back to your, your timeline, as you're doing the Bible quizzing and your, you know, your dad's going to church, um, I, I wanted to ask you before you go into whatever happens next, what was your, was your home life improving in any noticeable way in, in terms of the, the heartaches that you would face as a child? And then, you know, what happened after that? Um, it seemed to, at first, um, I know my dad did get a job that we all like kept praying for and praying for like the church, the Baptist church as well was praying for him to get a job. And I think that pressure that was put on him, he ended up getting a job. Um, he quit then soon. And we kind of went back into the financial struggles that we had. Um, and it's sad to say now, but he, um, I also watched him lose his passion for Jesus. And like, he stopped going to church eventually. Mm-hmm. I mean, he wasn't in it very long. And, you know, every other person, all my other siblings that I helped like talk to about Jesus and um, they were never as committed as I was, which was really hard because it was like, I felt like I was really trying to save and fix everything in our house, but it felt like nobody in my family really won Jesus as bad as I did, which, Mm. um, you know, was hard for me to grasp. And so life didn't really seem to get better. It was just that at first it really felt like I had hope and, um, and then, you know, watching my dad slowly lose it again and just kind of go back into his old habits and our home life not improve. And to an extent, I feel like when I, um, was on the last leg of my Christian journey, cause I was a Christian for five years. Um, um, when I was about 17, 18, life got harder. You know, I had a lot of traumatic experiences actually in those years than I ever did the rest of my life. Hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, feel free to um, t- take us into the, some of the details there of that part of your story. Um, cause uh, w- would you say there's anything more about your Christian life that you wanted to, sh- you know, share before we start to talk about the beginnings of your deconversion? Um, so yeah, I feel like there's so much, but so much good stuff to share. <laughs> we don't have enough time. Um, I definitely wanted to talk about like how, I'm in therapy now. Okay. If anyone's struggling with their deconstruction, um, or with their identity, I always recommend therapy, you know? Um, and so in therapy, it really helped me to split up my spiritual journey as stages. So I had like stage one, stage two, stage three, stage one was when I was like firm in the belief. And stage two was when I slowly started deconstructing and transitioning. And then stage three is where I'm at now. Um, so stage two, like I had mentioned, were the hardest, um, out of this whole journey. Cause I felt like a really good visual for this, how I felt it's like, there's these two mountains, like there's a mountain of just this strong faith as a Christian. And then there's this mountain of atheism. Like I'm a firm atheist. I'm confident that there's no God, that there's no heaven and hell. Um, I'm confident in who I am. Okay. There's these two mountains. I felt like that stage two, I was in that valley right between. Like I, I felt fallen off this mountain. I no longer belong there, but I no longer belonged. I didn't belong here either. This was brand new to me. It was unfamiliar and it was scary. I, you know, I, I was scared of atheists. I was scared of, you know, liberals even like I, I, I wasn't familiar with that. And I was conditioned to really look at those people as lost in need of desperate saving bad people um, with bad beliefs. And so it was like, I was in between and that was so miserable because I didn't know who I was. I didn't know who I wanted to be. I knew I couldn't be a Christian because I lost my belief just naturally. Um, That is a big thing I want to point out too, is I felt like I lost control of my belief. Like I, um, slowly just lost my beliefs. I found myself, um, you know, 
getting out of church, not attending as much until I stopped attending. Um, I first left the Baptist church and I did try different non-denominational churches, you know, more relaxed churches. Cause I thought maybe the extreme Baptist church was a problem. Um, but you know, I, I, that didn't work out for me. I slowly found myself stopped praying. I had a lot of quiet time with God when I was Christian, a lot of connection, um, with prayer. I had my own journal that I would like write these letters to God. I would, um, write down different topics I wanted to, um, give myself hope for, you know, with anxiety, depression, like I, I had a strong connection. And so it's like, I slowly started losing that. And that was very scary because I started, I didn't recognize myself and I didn't know who I was going to become. I didn't know what I wanted or who I wanted to be. Um, well, what so was that, it that, like, what caused you to originally have any issues at all? Cause I mean, it's, it's kind of like, um, how should I say it? It's kind of like if, if Christianity is this, this mighty Oak, that's got very deep roots that grew very slowly and it's got deep roots and you know, the, the storms can come, but they're, you know, they're not going to make it fall down. Um, the storms of life can come and they'll blow it, but this, this tree is rock solid, you know, so to speak proverbially. And when you look at that, from a, you know, from a Christian perspective, they'd say, yeah, it's, 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 it's not going to fall because it can't fall. Jesus is, is real. And, mm-hmm. and the truth is the, in the gospel. And so for someone to eventually move on from that, like there obviously had to be some things that slowly pulled those roots out of the ground. Like what was, what were some of the first things that, that you'd say, or maybe they, at the time you didn't think there were issues they were going to lead you anywhere bad, so to speak, from a Christian perspective, like what were, what were the first things that actually looking back on it, you'd say this, this actually started to make, raise alarm bells and put splinters in my mind that I had to deal with. Mm, great question. Great question. And that's probably my favorite part of my story now to tell is what really made me start deconstructing. Right. Um, I think of the Bible story um, with the house built on sand. Um, that was a sh- story that really Gave me a lot of guilt and shame. Um, just thinking about. Can you do the hand motions? Oh no, there's hand <laughs> motions. What did I miss? Oh yeah, well I guess this, you'd have to have gone to VBS as a kid to learn yeah. all that. But... <laughs> so I just missed the cheesy stuff. That's all. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, no, but as a creative writer, I kind of like looking at that story, the Bible story of a house built on sand, and that's probably how Christians now would describe me, right? You know, my house built on sand. You know, it wasn't on a firm foundation, which looking now, it's like, I never needed a house. Okay. I, I, I never asked to build a house. I needed freedom. I needed safety. And that doesn't belong in a house on a foundation that belongs in the open air because that's an open mind an open heart, open eyes. That's what I want. That's what I always deserved was that freedom. And so what really helped me to start deconstructing was getting in a safe environment. Um, so I moved out of my parents' home when I was 19 years old And, um, when I moved out, that's when that, um, like I said, that miserable time really started for me because I went from being in a house full of six people with a lot of chaotic noise, a lot of dysfunction and, um, struggling to have meals and, you know, struggling to have clean clothes and, um, to even be able to take showers because we didn't have towels and things like that. The water bill wasn't always paid, you know, just this hard, hard dysfunctional life. And going from that to then being on my own in an apartment, um, I remember looking around my small apartment when I first moved in, I had a few small boxes and I had my chihuahua, (laughs) like, here's my roommate. So yeah, I was, I was alone. And it was like the first time in my life, I was really physically alone like that, living alone. And that was scary, but the best thing that ever happened to me, because I got away from the toxic. I got away from this function. I got away from the unsafe environment and I was now in a safe environment. And when you're in a physical safe environment, I feel like that's the very first step in accessing emotional safety and um, mental safety. Um, and, you know, I was left to my own thoughts, my own thinking, my own actions, my own words. Um, You know, I didn't have any external factors that were pushing me down or keeping me down or hurting me. Hmm. What you're saying reminds me too of um, the way that coronavirus has affected our society a little bit, because I think for a lot of people, 
they were, you know, addicted to going to church physically every Sunday, every Wednesday night, whatever. And all of a sudden to not be able to go for a few months, at least it, it's like it created, even though they may have had a, a safe home life, just being forced to be separate where church at best is, is, is virtual. Mm-hmm. Um, it, I think it helped a lot of people say, you know, to what, is this actually, was this helping me or hurting mm-hmm. me? And it's, I know what you mean. It gives you just the, the freedom to kind of reevaluate how things have been going. Oh, absolutely. That's a really good point. The um, just being on a mandated quarantine and being, you know, having to stay home. And you know, I think I agree that was probably good for a lot of people. Um, it's scary at first to be alone with yourself or um, away from just, you know, the I think a lot of people are avoidant. You know, we go to work, we work, 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 and distract ourselves from our own thoughts, our own life. Maybe that's going on at home, or we we go to church all the time. You know, we're we're constantly just out away from ourselves. <laughs> and Christianity yeah. feeds off that. You know, I, I believe that Christianity comes from this foundation of we're going to detach you as far away from yourself as we can, so that you have no option but to attach yourself to something external, which is church, which is God, which is the Bible, which is a pastor. Yeah. And so with this quarantine, I'm sure that there are a lot of people that were then forced to be with themselves. And it almost leaves you with this beautiful place of who am I? Who do I yeah. want to be? Who have I been? So for you with this, with this, um, you know, this, this apartment space you had there at that stage of your life, for a lot of people, they might, for a lot of Christians, I would imagine that they might think to themselves, well, that's, that's a great time for you to really listen to what the spirit is telling you to obviously heal, to be more and more grounded. You know, you now have more and more time. You have less excuses to not be in the word. There's Mm -hmm. nobody, you know, interrupting you. Um, How did that play out differently for you instead of, instead of the, the new peace and the new quietness and safety, instead of it drawing you to the things of the spirit, so to speak, and giving the spirit an opportunity to, to, really, you know, speak, have, not, not have to speak over everybody else, but to just speak to you quietly. Well, it's yeah. almost like that still small voice, literally. Um, but you, you, it meant something different to you to have that quietness. Like, how did it, what made it different for you than it would have been for a Christian would have just said, thank you, Jesus. Let's now let's Jesus, let's talk. Oh, that question got me very, very excited. Cause I actually wrote about that yesterday. Okay. Um, and so On writing blog? about Yes. Yes. For my blog. Um, so, well, this is probably going to be my second blog post because I haven't published it yet. My first one was about um, how I was treated as a woman in the church, um, the, the need to submit and not have a voice and how that affected me and how that pushed me to make a blog and have a voice. Um, but I did write yesterday, actually, in thinking about this interview, about um, that still small voice and how instead of me going to a quiet, safe, peaceful place, instead of hearing God's still small voice, um, I heard my own. And this was probably the most beautiful thing that helped me in my deconstruction was how I started to understand this. I always had that still small voice with me. Um, Going through the abuse at home, the neglect at home, um, watching my siblings go through abuse, you know, I had that voice with me. And the voice sounded like, you're going to be safe someday. You're going to be okay. This is temporary. Um, You are loved. You are cared for. And um, at the time, as a Christian, I was like, okay, this is God. This is God speaking to me. And this is God looking out for me. And in lots of ways, I saw God as the one saving me from ideas like suicide. And um. Now, going to this apartment, being on my own, I still felt that voice follow, but the voice sounded different, you know, and instead of, I'm, it's not really like a voice, it's just kind of like, you know, thoughts I would have or like nudges in my heart. Now I know it's my intuition. Um, it's just myself, the experiences I've had and I've learned from, you know, having that wisdom that coming back to me. Um, I had that in my apartment and it sounded different, you know, like I said, um, it was instead like, you are safe now. You have yourself now. Um, You are in control. You are free. Mm. 
And as you can see, a lot of those thoughts conflict with the biblical God. You know, um, God is in control. Um, I'm not in control of myself. His ways are above my ways. The thoughts above my thoughts. You know, I cannot trust myself. My heart is wicked. Who can trust it? And those are Bible verses. So it's like yeah. that conflicts with the some that voice I had, that that those thoughts I had, those nudges I had. But I knew innately that they were true. I knew that it was true that I was safe now. I knew that it was true that I was in control, that I had myself, that um, I was loved, I was cared for, and I was free. Mm -hmm. And so then it's funny you mentioned quarantine because I moved out in November 2019. And most people remember COVID kind of starting around March 2020. Um, so I was in my apartment for about four or five months at that time. And I was laid off from my grooming job for a month due to mandated quarantine in Ohio. And it was just, it worked out perfectly that that quarantine happened when I started deconstructing because I spent that month, like the learner I am, the question asker I am, I just did a lot of research. Uh, the first thing I really looked into was humanism. Um, I think that's how I'd label myself before anything else, being a humanist. You know, I believe in the good of humanity. I believe humans first above everything else, before policies, before um, belief systems. Um, so I, I'm big into human rights and I'm, um, I want my life to reflect that. Um, but yeah, so yeah. Well, can I ask it, at that point, it sounds like you were just kind of shifting internally fairly slowly. Like it wasn't just like, you know, you learn some things within a month, bam, I'm out. It sounds like you were shifting very slowly, but in the midst of shifting, whether it's quick or slow, you have a lot of chances to um, self-correct from a Christian perspective, meaning to say, I I might think this, but the Bible says this, and if if I'm understanding it correctly, the Bible, and if it's it's saying this, and and I'm saying something opposite, I have to bow my knee. You know, this the the Bible is the truth. I'm. I need to be willing to humble myself and be teachable to the, to, you know, the, what the Bible says. It sounds like just from what you've said so far that you were kind of taking a, a power to yourself. Like you were it sounded almost like you, you had, didn't have the power that you had needed before in life mm -hmm. to, you know, make decisions for yourself and to do what you needed to do to feel safe. It almost sounds like you were being empowered, but that, that empowerment was enabling you to rebel, for lack of a better word, to rebel against the Bible in at least very small, you know, degrees. But was there any ever a point at which you were saying to yourself, like you mentioned, for example, this submission to men? Um, you know, say say you you know the church had been really clear. You know, God has God is is described in masculine terms. Um, he has a son. You know, where in the world is the mother? Uh, well, she was there before, but you know, th there's no mother figure now. It's all a masculine Godhead. Um, God's always putting men in charge as pastors, men as the priests, um, men as the um, prophets by and large. Um, you know, it's just men, men, men leading everything. And if you were, as you're slowly thinking through things on your own, thinking, I, I'm not sure that that's the way life should be. Maybe women should also be in authority and have the same, you know, chances and rights as, as men in these senses. When you have that and you look at the Bible, you could obviously say, well, maybe I misinterpreted the Bible and some people do that. But if, if whatever, you know, if it's, if it's, isn't a good example, pick a different topic, but for whatever topics you were saying, I actually disagree with the Bible. I don't think this is where I want my life to, to be. Well, my worldview should not you know, this doesn't feel healthy to me. How did you, like knowing in one sense, the Bible is the healthiest path to take. And yet you're saying, I'm not taking that path, but the path I am choosing is healthy. How did you merge those and deal with the, you know, the discrepancy, so to speak, of those worldviews? Of course. Yeah. Good question. So like I mentioned, um, it was like you said as well, it was very gradual. Um, like I said, I kind of went through that, those three stages. So um, it wasn't like stage one to stage three where I was this faithful Christian and then now I'm this confident atheist um, with my own identity, 
Um, I didn't go from Republican to Democrat. You know, it those changes were very gradual. At, the more information I took in, the more processing I was able to do in a safe space. And then the more um, questions I was able to ask. Um, when I was a Christian, I recognized that I um, was taught to block out a lot of information that was contradictory. And I also did it to myself. You know, I refused to listen to other world point uh, views. And um, I was scared, really, of anyone who had beliefs that weren't Christian um, because I didn't want to be swayed. I didn't want Satan to get me, things like that. It was that fear um, driving that. Um, so when I had this gradual change, I do um, know of two events that happened to me as well that were both traumatic that kind of propelled this as well. So it was that gradual shift um, with gaining access to information, to becoming a more critical thinker, um, to being on my own, having more control and authority over my um, physical space, my body, my thoughts, my mind. All of that coupled with the events that happened to me that directly um, contradicted the Bible in a way and made me start really thinking about if those beliefs do align with what I believe. And the first, these are um, definitely vulnerable. And I hope um, if you need like a trigger warning, definitely one um, about sexual abuse. Um, I won't go into too much detail, but just to kind of outline um, the what it is. Um, so the first event was um, discovering that one of my siblings, um, my older brother, was um, he had molested. Um, and I, for a long time, this person was he was my best friend, and I had complete trust in him. I had um, I saw him as a father figure because my father was not one for me. And um, I grew very close to him. He was a very um, gentle, sensitive, kind person. And um, I never would have thought that anything monstrous like that would have happened behind closed doors. But um, it did. And when the person that was abused came to me and told me, I believed them. And I went through this process of grief where I tried to, gr I, it felt like my brother died to me, like he passed away. I, I grieved the loss of him. As a person, my per my perspective of him, my image of him was gone. It was dead. It was no longer valid because you cannot rape somebody and be a kind person. You cannot rape somebody and be a good person. And what really stuck out to me was my desperate attempt to witness and witness to my older brother and to save him. He was always resistant to it, kind of like my mom. There were moments where he would go to church with me, where he said he wanted a relationship with Jesus, but for the most part, like he was getting into rough things, you know, drugs, friends, whatever. And I remember this specific conversation where I'm sitting in a car with him and I'm witnessing and I'm telling him the gospel, you know, the, the raw gospel. And I'm like, he's just going on and rattling about how he's a bad person, terrible person. He doesn't deserve what I'm talking about, you know, Jesus. And I'm like, you know what, like, you know, no sin is greater than another, you know, God views us as his children. Jesus views us as, you know, um, his sheep, like we can be saved, what, whatever, you know, whatever you've done, Jesus will forgive you. That's what I was taught for, you know, those five years. That's what I learned to believe for myself and for others. And I was so used to witnessing. So I was like, this was one of the most important moments for me was witnessing to my best friend, my brother. And he goes, no, but you don't understand. I don't deserve forgiveness. And he told me what he did. And that was the first time I heard it. And then within that same day, the person, I um, was able to talk to them and they told me as well that it was true. Mm -hmm. So, like I said, I went through that grief and um, it was feeling like somebody that I had grown to love and trust completely and having a person that knew me very well and loved me for who I was accepted me finding out then that like oh, almost overnight that that person is a monster. That person is terrible and could do those terrible things. Like going through that grief, it was like, I it definitely took a hit on my trust for people and for um, God. And I remember thinking, why would God allow something like that? And why would God sit there and let me witness to somebody, you know, and, I guess I even thought hard about why we got to allow someone like that to come into a church, you know, like somebody with a past of violating someone else's body. You know what I mean? Like it was just, that was a huge thing for me. And 
I knew that I was drifting from God when I told myself I will never have a relationship with him again. And um, I believe the abused over the abuser. And I um, started to question God and the goodness of him. And so then, um, you know, when that happened, that was when I was still living at home. So obviously I've been grieving that this gradual loss in my faith. And then, um, within the second, I think it was the second month at my apartment, I, I found myself, it was very interesting because I was in this extreme version of purity culture. Like I, I believed in purity culture. I was encouraged in it. Um, my church actually would go and buy me modest skirts to wear because my parents couldn't afford them. And I would wear these like modest skirts past my knee. And, um, I believed, you know, that my body was holy and sacred and I didn't want to cause a brother to stumble. I didn't want to give any man an attempt to lust. I didn't want them to sin because of me and my body, you know, and I um, was, I remember not going to my prom, one of my proms in high school, because I, the music was um, secular music. And I was like, I'm going to be in here if I go. So I didn't go, even though I was asked. And I remember writing like a letter to my future husband that night too about God and how I would remain pure for him. And um, I ended up buying myself my own purity ring too. And the purity ring said in Hebrew, I will wait. And I wore that purity ring all the time. So it was like, no, it was encouraged to me in church, but um, I was just, you know, very involved in that. And So what's interesting to me is when I'm gradually deconstructing and I had this traumatic event happen to me, I then, um, the second month I'm living by myself, I find myself on these dating apps and um, I started finding validation in men. And I found myself drifting from this idea of modesty, wanting to show myself off and just this attempt for attention and for acceptance and for belonging and love. Um, And... um, so I got involved with hookup culture and um, the traumatic event for me was losing my virginity. And um, at that time, I had not announced that I didn't really told anyone that I was deconstructing, let alone that I was no longer Christian. And that was something I struggled with um, being a for a little bit. I felt like I was a Christian publicly because I had a huge you know, I had a pretty good following on social medias and I was outspoken about it with my friends and people, you know, even I work with. But on, you know, privately, I felt like I was starting to really lose my belief and I was starting to question everything and I was starting to drift away. And I felt like it was too hard for me to talk about that out loud because I didn't feel like I would be accepted and I didn't feel like it was safe to do that. So I lose my virginity. And if you can imagine with purity culture, that is like the biggest no, no (laughs) in very simple terms, that was traumatic. And the person was not a Christian, you know, the person barely asked for my consent. And I remember, um, holding, sitting down, you know, with my knees locked to myself like this. And I put my head down and I was just sobbing. I was sobbing. And for the next few months, all I thought of myself was worthless. I thought of myself as a worthless person. And I think the first few words that came to mind was dirty, worthless, sinful, wrong. Um, felt like I deserved all the shame and the guilt. Um, Now I know obviously that that's not true. And that was just a result of the conditioning I had in that five years time. Um, So I've definitely worked through a lot of that in therapy and I've definitely come a long way in healing from those events. Um, But I would absolutely point to those as the two events that really um, helped push me into this deconstruction. Was it a sense like that you had messed up and God couldn't love you at all? Was, mm-hmm. was that going on or was it a different, different dynamic? Um, yeah, I would say so. I felt like at that time though, I was already struggling with my view of God. I was starting to feel like he couldn't really love people if he treated, if he allowed things to happen to people. Um, and I know there's all the Bible answers for that, you know, like sin and, um, you know, there's heaven and hell for that, but I couldn't wrap my brain around. I still, still refuse to believe that a good God would allow bad things to happen to people and bad things happen in our world. And I refuse to accept that people get to be blamed for that. 
And, you know, especially people that are marginalized or abused or or in the minorities, you know, I refuse to believe that those people are at fault for our world being fallen or broken. And I refuse to believe that their sin is the reason that things like rape exist, things like um, poverty, things like, um, you know, black kids being shot by police officers. You know, all of of these things are happening in our world. I refuse to believe that it is because people are just sinful. You know, I I believe that there is no God and um, that's, that's the end of it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So how can you tell, talk more about how the, the experience you had there, the the last experience you talked about, how, how did that contribute directly to you losing your faith more like what, because if, what I mean by that is, and I don't want to anyway, make light of, you know, some of the painful things you've been through, because then, you know, if any any questions I ask, feel free to, um, we can skip them if it's not um, feeling like something you want to talk about. But for a lot of people who are deconstructing the ability to be more sexually free feels like a natural consequence. Um, you know, people that used to think of virginity as a big deal realize it's not. Uh, people who used to be in big in a purity culture realize it's it's a good thing to enjoy your body. Um, people who are afraid of pleasure are all of a sudden enjoying it. Um, like, how did that dynamic and the, some of the painful parts of your story, how did that contribute to you? Like, how did how were you talking to God, so to speak, in your mind, if there was a still a God voice there? How were you talking to that voice and saying, you know, I've, I'm experiencing some of these things. I have had these things in the past. I've got some of these things going on currently. And and yet you're still kind of trying to figure out where you are with God. Like, how did how did the, the sexual side of it affect how you thought of God at that point? Mm, that's, that's tough, because I feel like at this time it still might be a little muddy. Um, you know, the thoughts I really had through that process, um, because from what I remember, it was just a lot of heavy grief and, um, a lot of guilt and shame. Like I mentioned, um, I know that especially when that happened to me, it felt like then an avoidance an avoidance to talking to God at all. Um, I know I already had had, um, ideas that God might not even be out there, but at first I would never say that out loud. Like, even if I was by myself, I would not say that out loud. Like it was just in my head. And if, the thought popped up, I'd immediately be like, oh gosh, think, you know, and then it gradually became like, okay, I can think about these things safely. Like it's okay to do so. And, um, I started learning, um, about things that could, um, basically replace what I was taught from a Christian viewpoint. So for example, when it came to sex, like, um, having sex, um, I knew what that looked like in the Bible. I knew how God viewed that basically from what I learned and was taught and believed. Um, I kind of knew basically what his say was on that. So I just got a lot of guilt and shame when it happened. But then I was like, okay, I kind of combated that with science and with psychology um, and just basically with facts, which I, I believe it's so important to be a critical thinker in our world. And it's so important to trust the facts and read the facts and um, do research and just, just have access to information, stay open-minded. So you're able to have that. Um, and so I really just started learning about sex from a secular um, viewpoint. And, um, you know, now I see sex um, pleasure in that way is a basic human need as well. Um, not only for connection with a partner, um, with yourself, um, if you're masturbating, but also for your body, it's very good for your body and it's very healthy. And what's dangerous is when you suppress that and, um, yeah, I mean, suppressing that is the real danger. And, um, it's, it's, I see Christianity doesn't want people to have control over themselves and their bodies. Um, so they're going to continue to restrict things like that because that gives you access to your own body. Um, and then eventually your own mind and your thoughts. So I, I, I see why that is going to have a tight grip, you know, especially when it comes to women, women's Mm -hmm. bodies are controlled. You know, we see recently with Roe v. Wade, you know, being overturned, like there is that 
grip, that, that grip over women's bodies, because there's that need to control and to keep control. And I see the same thing as Christianity. It's that, that need to control people, especially the marginalized and the minorities. And so they're going to do everything in their power to do that by teaching you, conditioning you, forcing you to detach from yourself. Hmm. It sounds like, and I don't put words in your mouth, but it sounds like from an outsider perspective, that some of this stuff was about, um, how should I put it, <clears throat> about you gradually feeling more comfortable in your own skin, obviously going on with the safety and reclaiming your identity, like figuring out who you are apart from what other people told you you need to think of yourself as or whatever you were forced to to be like to fit into certain you know situations. Like just to, to say, I don't need to hear all these other voices, like, I'm just going to, I'm going to decide for myself. And it, it's a, it's a really cool example of empowerment in a sense, because and I know you're probably going to talk more about that through some more of your story, but like, just the idea of people feeling empowered is so critical. And I, I love, like, I know you, we talked before we started recording about my interviews with my kids and so forth. But one of the things that I love to do with them is to say who has the power over what you believe and i know we're not talking about it we're talking about the body here but you know the the correspondence of who has the power and i've used the example before of you know if there's some uncle or cousin that you see at a party you know as a and you're a six-year-old girl and you know that the uncle wants to give you a hug and he may be the most innocent loving you know kind uh, good man in the world but if the six-year-old girl doesn't want a hug does she have to give him one and of course the answer is no it's it's her her body her choice and I tell the kids that I, I, you know, I talk them in at night. I'll say things like, you know, do you want a hug from daddy? And if they say no, I'll, I'll actually, I'll say, oh, okay, no problem. And I'll actually reinforce it by saying it's, you know, after I say, okay, no problem. I'll say, it's your body. You get to choose. And so mm -hmm. they get this sense strongly every night. Um, but I, I try to relate that to like, who, who has the power over what you believe? And does anyone get to make you believe, you know, do you have, and I'll even say it in a self-deprecating way like do you have to be an atheist no do you have to agree with daddy no do you have to be a christian like mama no who has the power and you know you get them you see them lighting up saying i do i do i get the power and man that's so critical i mean whether you're talking about your 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 body everything from a you know hugging to to sex or it's you're talking about worldview and belief systems like to say i have power here and it feels like it feels like in between your your stories, there's this. I'm seeing a, a, at least some of a thread of you were slowly taking your power back and figuring out how to do that in a way that was good. You know, a good good choice for you. Now, it sounds like it wasn't immediate, um, but it was like it was like you were slowly feeling your way out, as if you were in the you know in a dark cave coming out of it, but through it coming into the light, finding yourself more and more powerful. And I I love the fact that that is a very very common theme of, of deconstruction stories, deconversion stories, especially where people felt like they finally had a chance to, whether it was to speak up, to say, you know what, I never said before, I don't think that verse makes sense. Or there is a discrepancy there between those gospels and I can't harmonize them and I don't want to anymore. That doesn't make sense. I don't have to listen to the preacher telling me that those verses actually do make sense together. They don't. And to take back that power in all these arenas and say, I have the power to just say, I'm going to take a different path. I'm not being mean to everybody. I'm going to take a different path here. And mm -hmm. so many people, I think, would say in, in different ways, I didn't have that before. I didn't, I didn't think I could do it, or I was afraid God would get me if I was so belligerent to God. And, you know, he's the judge. Well, you know, I have to bow my knee to the judge and the king. And to say, actually, I'm, I'm going to be the judge over this one. I'm going to judge it, not God. And it feels that if you're if you're neck deep in Christianity, that feels so blasphemous. Whatever the co topic is, if you say I am the one taking the power, you're like, no, I shouldn't be doing this. And when people finally do it, like really do it and say I am fully taking the power here, it's it's scary. But once you do it and realize it it was okay, lightning didn't strike you from heaven. <laughs> you you end up on the other side of that thinking, oh. Oh, okay. I can do this and it's okay. And I actually, I thought I'd feel bad about myself. Maybe, you know, something you mentioned masturbation. Maybe someone says, I've always felt guilty when I masturbated. And all of a sudden you're like, you know what? I'm going to masturbate and not feel guilty anymore, guilty about it anymore. And you're mm -hmm. like, oh, 
this is actually quite okay. I feel, I feel good about myself mm -hmm. and all these arenas to, to feel good in your skin. I, I just, I love that the, some of these threads are coming through your story and I'm glad that that's been so much of your, your journey so far. Oh, I appreciate that so much. You know, if I could just have that on rewind when I need a boost, that would be super nice. You know, it it's nice to see how far you can grow and how far you can not only with healing, but with gaining access to just the beautiful world out there, the beautiful experiences, the beautiful lessons you can learn. And um, I absolutely agree with you. Um, you know, I see myself growing in that. I see myself slowly taking back control over my life and my body and my mind. And I slowly see um, my need to speak out, my need to talk about it, my need to have a voice because for so long I felt like it wasn't exactly mine. And, um, you know, I just appreciate that so much. And <laughs> yeah, I love too that when people go through these things, when you're on the other side of it, your filter is much tighter. Like, you know, if you were to say, well, say you got in a relationship where some guy, you know, beat the shit out of you and you get out of it and you're like, I'm never, if I see any red flags about him, you know, hitting me, that, that relationship ends immediately. And you, you get, you get filters that get tighter and tighter. And it's not like you want to be sarcastic or, or always suspicious of everybody, but you just say, if you have a claim, whether it's a claim about, you know, heaven, hell, ultimate reality, or just a claim of, you know, you're a good, you might be a good partner you know, back it up. I want to see it. If you've claimed to be, you might be a good partner. I want the proof. And yeah. I'm, by the way, I'm glad in that case for, the, for you that you've get, found that with your fiance, but just, you know, even if you take it to the broadest picture of religion, if you have a claim, my spidey senses are, are going to be a lot stronger now, you know? Of course. Yeah. I wanted to point out, um, I wanted to mention something as well for anyone who might be listening, um, that when you, come out of Christianity and you're deconstructing, um, shame and guilt is very hard to shake. Um, and it, it, most of the time it's just ingrained or innate because it's been there for so long. It's been conditioned into you, especially if you are breaking the rules or you're doing what you were never supposed to do. Um, and I will mention, I celebrate March, 2020, because that's the month that I actually publicly said, like, I'm no longer a Christian. I'm happy with that. And I consider that, um, I actually call it um, apostate anniversary or nice. next letter birthday. <laughs> I like that. Yes, I need to copyright that. Um, but so with that, like I will say, I mean, it's been since March 2020 and there's still moments where I feel like about a shame or I feel guilt about something. It's just how I've, I, I'm learning and being gentle with myself and how I narrate that now, you know, instead of saying, oh gosh, like what if that's God? I'm now saying like, no, this is a result of, you know, what you had been shown or taught for so long. And, um, you know, I try to reframe it. Like, you know, I'm slowly learning to let go of shame. And if it pops up every now and then it's okay. It's not my fault. You know, it, it's, it's going to happen sometimes. And I just have to be very gentle with myself and remind myself of how far I've come in letting go and how it's a long journey. It might be lifelong and that's okay. Um, I know, for example, um, I had a car accident. It's my first ever car accident. And it was very traumatic for me. It was February, 2021. So about a year after I really like came out and deconstructed um, and was on that prop, like on that journey. And this car accident was my fault. I failed to yield about a block from my house. Um, and I had, I was in this small Pontiac car sedan and this Chevy Avalanche um, T-boned me. And from my passenger side, thankfully, but it completely totaled my car. And um, I had never been anything like that before. And it scared the living daylights out of me. And um, it actually launched me into like a month long depression. And thankfully, I was already in therapy. That was one of the biggest reasons I joined therapy was because I could not process that car accident. Um, I remember being on the phone with my uh, best friend about a week after, after avoiding her texts and everything, because I couldn't even be on my phone. Like it, I was so like detached and isolated because I was trying to process that and um, really struggling with that event. And when I finally ended up calling her, um, I just basically said what happened, you know, through tears. And um, she uh, said she was glad I was okay. And, um, I remember one of the first things I said to her was like, I can't help but like wonder if, um, you know, like is, is God trying to like, and I just kind of started to trail off 
about God. And she immediately knowing my background, my history and what I had started, um, the deconstruction I just started, she firmly said, Bell, do not go there right now. Don't think about that right now. You know, you will have the time to process that, but let's keep God out of it right now. Let's keep your, your past faith out of it right now. And I'm thankful for that because I literally just blocked it off for a while and talked to my therapist about it. Um, you know, working with a professional is the way to go. And um, she helped me eventually sort through that. But I just had that instant fear, like, oh my God, God is trying to kill me to bring me back to him to make me a Christian again. And I was taught as a Christian that that's certain ways God would reach people is like, you know, people, someone would go through something traumatic. God would use it for his glory, for his purpose. And he'd basically reel you back. And um, so that was the first thing my mind jumped to. And, you know, I look now at it fully healed. Um, and I look at that event and I'm like, no, that was just, I was very shaken up. I was going through something traumatic. I was very scared. And that fear, um, you know, I just experienced that fear, but I narrate it now as I got in a car accident happens to, you know, a lot of people it's common. I didn't mean to do that. Um, I didn't mean to send the passenger to the ambulance because she like smashed her leg too. And that was very hard for me. Um, but I was like, I didn't mean to do that. Um, accidents happen and I'm going to be okay. It's just a car, things like that. Um, and I can remember only, I think just this summer I had to go pick up my sister from work and there was a, like a severe thunderstorm and it was like early in the morning. And it was like the thunderstorm where you can't even drive and like see almost two feet in front of you. It's so bad. And that was the very first time that I have drove through something like that. And didn't think about how God might kill me in that. Hmm. Like I, I, I actually played this song. Um, it's called pages. I forgot the artist's last name, but it's like Stephanie something. And the song's called pages. My fiance sent it to me and it's basically singing about how she's letting go of the Bible and she's writing her own pages. It's a very empowering song. And I played that music. I blasted it in my car and I drove through this thunderstorm and I'm like, I get to decide like, how I think about this, how I feel about this. And, you know, I said, there is no God and he's not going to cause an accident. And if an accident happens, it doesn't mean it was a God. It just means that there was an accident. And um, that was a very empowering moment for me. And um, I look at that memory um, with happiness, knowing that I am healing and I'm um, definitely formulating my own thoughts and my own beliefs now. And I'm very confident with myself. I'm very comfortable with myself. And I, for the first time would say, I have a really, um, I have an identity Mm. and it's, it's crafted by me. And that's what matters. That's what I want for everybody is that they have their own identity and it's, you know, consensually theirs and it's um, made up of what they want, what they need. And um, they get to have the ultimate say in it. Like you said, you don't get to control your kids. You don't get to control your friends, your spouse, you know, anybody, you, you only get to control yourself and your actions, your thoughts, your beliefs, and your words. And um, I think if everybody can arrive at that point, I think um, we would all be a lot kinder to ourselves, knowing that our lives reflect us and our values and, you know, not some God that is, violent or harsh, you know? Yeah. Well said. So when you going back to the the time of your apostate anniversary, when you left, when you officially kind of recognized yourself, I'm out, was there a sense of disappointment about the reality that there's probably no afterlife coming for you? Mm, So it's a good question because I could absolutely see why that would be there for people. Um, I think for me though, it was kind of the opposite. I felt like actually felt a lot of relief um, knowing that there's no pressure for me to live some sort of life on this earth now for some potential afterlife that I really don't have proof for, or it, it's not um, factually sound. There's no experiences, especially not personal experiences of an afterlife. So to me, it took off a lot of pressure and it actually gifted me a very beautiful thing. And that's living my life now in the most genuine way, the most authentic way. Um, and that is the most beautiful gift that I've been, that I've found and been given. And um, I now definitely live my life um, in a very genuine way. And um, it's very aligned with my values. And it's just, I feel like I now can appreciate the life I have now and um, appreciate the time I have. Um, time is so much more precious to me. 
And there's no, um, I always thought it was very sad when I hear Christians talk about how badly they wanted Jesus to come back and to take them up into the air, into, um, into heaven and how bad they wanted revelations to happen. And it's what a sad way to live, you know, to just wish for the end to be here, to wish for your life to be done. And I know heaven is promised to be some beautiful place where you're with people that may have passed that you loved, or um, it's a place of just pure happiness and joy. But it's like life is still so beautiful with all of the pain and suffering or the the sadness, the, you know, I feel like it's all just life. You know, it's, I almost can't imagine a life just of happiness and good things. And it's almost like you can't really appreciate those if you have, you know, the bad moments come, you know? Yeah. So I've just really taken, um, I really just owned my life and said, you know, with the time I have, I don't know how long it is, but I'm not worried about where I go after. Cause I do believe I'm just going to be into the ground probably with some cute mushrooms. <laughs> If you could have an eternal life, would you choose? If if there were an option, would no. you would you want to live forever? No. Gotcha. Interesting. <laughs> I do ask that occasionally for people, and I still struggle with that one. I I, I did want to live forever, and I still do. Yeah. And I know people say philosophically it doesn't make sense because you would eventually get bored out of your mind. Um, <laughs> I think it would take me a long time, like trillions of years, to get that bored. Yeah. I just I love. I love doing stuff. I love learning. I love exploring. And when you realize too, like with the web telescope, like just how beautiful and big the universe is, mm. if I had an option to just explore everywhere I could, you know, like in a sci-fi kind of sense, I would, I'd love to explore everywhere. And that would, that would take a bloody long time. No, absolutely. But. That's, that's actually really fun. Like, I think it would be kind of cool, like in a, like you said, a science fiction kind of way, if, we could just have different lives. Like we grow old and die. And then we just are born as a child. Maybe we're in like different countries every time or different home lives or, um, you know, never that I would wish abuse or anything on anyone, but, you know, just different experiences. So then kind of seeing where you end up, where you go, what you experience, what you explore. I think that's exciting. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, a couple more questions here. And we'll wrap up. Looking at your deconversion, did things like comparative mythology, um, studying the origins of, of Judaism and Christianity, you know, studying the origins, like where did the Bible come from? You know, why are there 66 books and why, why wait, some other churches have more books and, you know, which books went in and went out and, you know, why do the Jesus stories um, look so similar to Greek mythology that had been in existence for hundreds of years? Mm -hmm. um, you know, like, for example, you know, what Hermes, you know, could walk on water with his golden slippers um, there's even a story where, you know, Hermes is up on a mountain and he goes down across the water to help people. And Jesus is up on a mountain and he goes across the water um, to help people. Um, you know, Helios, the sun god, wore a purple robe and had a crown like the sun rays was like a crown around him. And Jesus ends up wearing a purple robe with a crown of thorns. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Dionysius could turn water into wine. A lot of people, and that's obviously just touching a few things of, of thousands, but for a lot of people, when they start to dig into that, it begins to help move the deconstruction along because they're like, this isn't just philosophically, do I think God should commit genocide? Or even to, to today's time, do I think it's okay that God isn't stopping the wars going on in the world or he's letting kids die of cancer? But those philosophical questions, as, as important as they are, you still have this sense of, yeah, but, but if God is true and he's someday going to answer all those questions then I can't just conclude because I don't like the fact that kids have cancer, that therefore there's no God. Maybe God's going to somehow do something amazing through this. And if he's the king, he still gets to choose. He gets to choose who lives and dies. He's the king. Um, and so people still struggle with some of that stuff. But a lot of people, you know, the philosophical part of it is where it starts. Like, you know, is genocide okay? Child brides that, that were commanded in the Old Testament, is that okay? Mm. But when you begin to actually say, well, where did this story come from? Or, you know, Yahweh having a wife named Asherah, people are like, you know what, if that, if that part of it is true, and eventually, you know, you learn enough to know it is true, that there's all these other comparative mythologies that you should have learned about, but didn't, mm -hmm. it helps you increase your ability to say, this is actually just, it's either a copycat or it's just another flavor of what everybody was doing back then. Mm -hmm. Did that become a part of your, your journey at all, either before or after deconstruction? 
Very interesting perspective. And I could see why a lot of people would start to question or um, just lose belief by studying other other myths and um, other stories. Um, I would say I am familiar with how mythology has themes that have applied to different stories. Um, the Walking on Water one I was aware of. Um, the Crown of Thorns and the Purple Robe is something I hadn't heard of, though. But um, I would say I've dipped my toes in that just a little bit. Um, I actually think the biggest thing for me was learning about evolution. Mm. Um, so that scientific theory um, of how we were created and how um, things have evolved. And I guess comparing it to my smaller view of how I've evolved, you know, it, it makes more sense to me. And I like that it's based on, you know, facts and um, s- studies and research. And um, so I would um, definitely encourage people to um, seek out credible resources, sources and um, do research and not just from one source, but multiple and to have open minds. Um, But I think studying different mythology and different stories and seeing the eerie similarities between the Bible, I think that would be huge. And I I honestly think I, I would love to dive more into that. Gotcha. Do you struggle at all with anger against Christians? Oh goodness, that's a good question um, because that's been pretty, pretty open. Um, it's given me a lot of insight about myself and about what I've gone through. Is really just that emotion, anger, um, the unpleasant emotions in general, but anger specifically. Because in the Bible, you know, they say the sun should not go down on your anger, or if you have anger, it should be righteous anger. It should be like you know, fueled with justice, which in itself is hypocritical because I believe. Christianity perpetuates a lot of injustice and doesn't have justice for um, people. So anyways, um, so when it comes to anger, I really struggle with that emotion the most because it was the most suppressed for me. And I wasn't allowed to be angry about what was going on at home. I wasn't allowed to be angry about how I was treated, how my siblings were treated, how my mom was treated. I wasn't allowed to be angry about what my brother did. Um, I wasn't allowed to be angry about a man um, not having consent and, you know, in a way taking what was so precious to me, my virginity. Like I I felt like I suppressed all of that consistently and repeatedly because that was what I learned was good to do. And even when I kind of started shaking off the belief, that view of that emotion still stayed for me. Um, And what helped me with that was basically replacing sermons with podcasts. And I would seek out, like I said, credible sources. I looked for doctors, for PhD students, things like that. And I studied a lot of psychology and, um, you know, that coupled with therapy really helped. And I learned about emotions and how emotions, you know, are there first off because we're humans, it's human nature to have emotions and it's unhealthy to suppress them and to avoid them or restrict them. Um, It's more healthy to feel them as they come, to experience them, to make meaning with them maybe, and um, just continue to live with them. You know, that's very healthy. And um, I actually heard from this podcast, it's a really cute visual and I love sharing with anyone who will listen to me. Um, how to view emotions because it's really helped me. So I hope it can help somebody else view emotions as like house guests. So like, let's say you're in this cute little um, fairy house. Okay. And you have emotions that come and knock on your door and they could be happy. They could be sad. They could be angry. They could be scared. Um, and so they come and knock on your door like, uh, one at a time. Let's say ang- uh, happiness knocks on your door and it's like, Hey, can I stay for a little bit? The good thing to do is like, hey, yeah, of course, like come in, sit on the couch, like let me grab you water, let's let's sit and chat for a little bit, come and visit. They're a house guest, you know, they're not going to be some creepy guy trying to bunk in your house, you know, they're just going to visit for a little bit and then they're going to take off, it's temporary. So then they're like, okay, I enjoyed my time here, you know, I enjoyed our conversation and I'm going to take off now. So they leave, like, thank you, that was pleasant. I learned from that. I I mean, I got to talk to them and stuff. I experienced them. So then, you know, let's say something happens to you, you know, whether it's something as simple as traffic or something extreme, like um, you watch your mother get hit, you know, something that deserves anger. Okay. And anger knocks on your door. You know, it's a lot of us open the door and we look at them and we're like, you're not very pretty. You're kind of ugly. And I, I don't know if I want to let you in because I'm, I'm scared of you myself. You, you're not really familiar with anger because you haven't allowed anger in. 
And you're taught in Christianity that anger is not welcome. Actual anger, genuine anger is not welcome in your house. Only things that are pleasant, like happiness, right? So it's normal to be scared of anger. It's normal to be wary of feeling angry or to experience it. Or when you do feel angry and it's hard to control it, it's normal if you've had a passive Christianity to not really know how to handle it, to be unfamiliar with it. And, you know, I've had to give myself grace in experiencing anger and then, um, you know, feeling terrible about it. You know, I, so when anger knocks, you know, when I feel angry or something happens and I think I'm going to you know, experience anger, I think of it like the house guest thing. So I'm like, okay, anger's knocking on my door. He just wants to visit for a little bit and he's not going to do harm. It's just an experience. It's temporary. So I let anger in, he sits down and I'm like, you want a water? And he's like, no, do I look like I want a water? And I'm just like, okay, let's talk. So then anger's like, okay, this happened, this happened, this happened. And he's just anger and you're just feeling it. You're sitting with it. And then eventually, you know, anger is let everything out to you. And you're like, okay, I've learned this. I mean, maybe I'm not going to be around this person anymore. Or I learned I'm going to leave for work a little earlier so I don't get stuck in rush hour. I'm going to learn from this anger. And now that I've had my time with him, he understands and I understand it's time for him to go. He gets up and he goes. And it's actually a pleasant departure. And maybe he'll come around again to visit, but it's just a visit. You know, these aren't roommates. The only person living in the house for you is yourself. And that's another thing with Christianity. We're inviting pastors in. We're inviting mentors in. We're inviting our um, spouses in, especially if you're a wife. And you're expecting these people to allow things in, to keep people out. And that's not their job. It's your job. And it's your right. And you have complete authority over your emotions. And so I think that if you're deconstructing, I know I will speak for myself, a big thing I had to learn and be okay with was experiencing emotion, especially anger. Good answer. I think I just add to that too. I think a lot of us do struggle with the idea that we were manipulated and lied to. And I think it can lead to bitterness, which I think is obviously never good for us to remain bitter for long, but it's definitely a a heartache to to think you know, I wonder how many of those pastors knew about the other dying and rising gods mm-hmm. and didn't talk about it. Or I wonder how many of them knew that, you know, that there are passages from Homer's uh, Iliad and Odyssey that are woven right into the Gospels and just didn't tell us. Wow. Um, all that kind of stuff. You just think, you all lied to us, either passively or actively. And mm-hmm. I think for me, that's, it's, it drives me to think if 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 I can't do anything else with my life, I just want to help people to say, even if you want to be a Christian, do it with all the information. You know, this whole background of we'll give you this little slice of information, even though there's so much more you should actually know before you commit your life to this character, Jesus, um, this literary character, Jesus, before you commit your life to him, let's let's talk about where it came from. And it's I think that's been a struggle for me at times to think, I wonder which I wonder which Bible college past teachers, professors knew. I wonder which pastors knew and just didn't say anything, but um, anyway. And I I won't, and I didn't want to like downplay the, the feeling of bitterness. Like you mentioned, like going through a season of like, just being bitter and angry, especially with those in the church and with God himself, maybe, or with the Bible, it's very valid because in a way you gave them your trust you know, you you trusted them to show you truth, to show you the way, the light. You sh- you trusted them usually with you know your body and restricting sex and restricting um you know really showing off any body parts. You know, like me wearing skirts. I, I trusted their their decision with that. Um, and you trust that you know you trust in this God. And when that comes with all the commitment and the time you give, the effort, um, the soul you put into it. I mean rightfully so you're going to be angry because that was violated in a way it was it was taken and um i think that it's it's essential to grieve that as well i think even just learning um grief the grief process with uh psychology you know like whether it's 
in a funeral or it's a breakup or it's leaving Christianity. Grief is a universal thing. It's a human nature thing to do and it comes naturally. And I think if we can learn um, more about grief and how to experience and work through it, I think we will be able to um, heal and in a very natural and human way. Um, Cause I'm not going to lie and say, I haven't felt anger because I felt a lot of anger um, and bitterness for the church. I think, um, for I've consistently felt a lot of compassion for the congregation, for the people that I was sitting among and the people that um, were sharing with me. Um, I think it's easier for me to find compassion for them because I see myself in their shoes and I know most of them have good intentions and are just misled and manipulated. Um, so I don't feel like I can experience a lot of anger with Christians, even that speak to me now. Um, however, I feel angry sometimes with how they may treat me, how they might try to still witness to me, or I'm going to pray for you. You know, that that's very rude and it doesn't feel good. And, um, but I feel a lot of bitterness for pastors. I feel a lot of bitterness for church staff, um, for um, parents that condition their children into Christianity. And when their children decide that they no longer want to go and they make that choice for themselves and the parents do not allow that or they do not accept them anymore, um, especially if, for an example, if they um, come out of the closet, you know, that that's a big example of how Christianity hurts people is they're not accepting of um, someone's love for another person. You know, if you're part of the LGBTQ plus community, you deserve to love another person. You deserve to be accepted and you deserve to define yourself, your identity, your sexuality. And um, what the church has done is just hurt people in that way and demanding that those people are wrong about themselves and that they need to fall in line and be traditional and normal, which is a lie. And so it's like, I feel angry most of the time for things that impact humans, which I think I correlate a lot with humanism. Anything that really um, has just suffocated human rights really gets a rise out of me. You know, women's rights, feminism, intersectional fe feminism. Um, like I said, the community, um, you know, Black Lives Matter movement even. Like I've seen people use the Bible for racism. It's all of these things that affect the people that I work with, I see at the grocery store, I am friends with, that I love. You know, when I see those people are being hurt by this toxic belief system and it's it, that deserves anger and it deserves bitterness in a way. And I'm just trying to make sure that for myself, personally speaking, that I will use that for good. And I will use that to just push me towards fighting for justice and advocating for people, advocating for myself. And the best way I know how to do that now is to continue sharing my story and to continue writing, um, to continue sharing my blog with people. And, um, you know, if People can take things from it that helps. Awesome. If they can't take anything from it, that's okay. I'm, I'm not, I don't want to force anything on anyone, but I really want to help people understand that your identity is yours and you should be making informed decisions that are based on information and your own personal beliefs. You know, it should be you. Yep. And that's, that's really what I want to preach, you know? <laughs> Do you ever get the sense that Christians hate you or think you're a traitor? Um, probably. I feel like I haven't gotten a lot of hateful messages, thankfully. Um, I've had a lot of sad people, I'd say, um, because I've never tried to be hateful to other people, um, because that's not normal to me. It's not natural. And I don't think, I don't really think it's natural for humans to just hate. Like hate is, I feel like the biggest enemy. Um, and love, um, naturally is the, the biggest, um, savior in that. So I, I try to love and not hate. And so when I have messages that may have hate in them, I just try to not interact with them. I know one time I got sassy and this girl had, um, she was somebody that followed my writings when I was Christian and she messaged me and she was like, um, I'm so sorry to see that you've backslid so much. Like, I hope you know that, um, you know, when you were speaking out for God's kingdom and everything, like you were doing so much good. And now that you're writing about your deconstruction and leaving Christianity, like you're hurting people. And she was going on about that. And oh, the um, irony. <laughs> oh, yeah. The irony. <laughs> and she ended it with, you know, I'm praying for you. And um, then she followed up and sent me a link to a book, like a Christian book. It wasn't the Bible. It was like some self-help book about like coming back to Jesus, I think is what it was called. And, um, I, 
I remember literally sending a book link back to her and the book was you are your own. Um, I forgot her name. She's a really good writer, but the book's called you are your own. And it's her deconstruction from evangelical Christianity and how she took ownership of her identity um, after that. And I sent her that link. I was like, send it right back to you. That's awesome. Well, yeah. Last, last question. We can keep this one quick. Um, assuming the best that you get to live a, hopefully a nice long healthy life, live to your fullest uh, potential. What would you like to use the rest of your life to do? What would you like people at the end of your your life to say, this is what she's been spending the last few decades doing? Writing, Mm -hmm. writing, Um, spreading love. Um, Mm -hmm. I'd say that. And me actually also simultaneously living my life for myself and not just living my life to help others or to just to do for others, because that's a common Christian belief, right? That we need to serve other people. We need to wash people's feet and we need to give all of us to help other people and serve other people, even at the expense of us. And I don't want that. You know, I want to be very well balanced in that. I want to write and inspire people. I want to speak maybe and inspire people. I want to write a book someday. And I want um, to do that while also making sure that my life still reflects what I want. And it's still about me at the end of the day, and I'm still enjoying it. And I'm really experiencing it to the fullest. Hmm. Good answers. I like that. Certainly sounds like you could look back um, at that, you know, later in life and say that was a life well lived. It was a success. So. Oh yeah. I'll have to watch this interview. <laughs> good, good stuff. Well, hopefully, hopefully it's the first of many interviews, especially if you start uh, publishing books. If you do publish a book, um, I definitely want to uh, be part of the team that helps you publicize that and get interviews for them. Um, I do just want to say a few quick things just to wrap us up. Uh, number one, again, thank you so much for sharing your story. It's been awesome to hear it and your insights. And I'd love to do a follow-up with you, especially like I said, with the book or if there's just other topics that come to mind. Um, also want to make sure I didn't fail to say thank um, thank you to your fiance for letting us you know, have you here, but uh, congratulations to you both um, for your upcoming uh, mm-hmm. marriage and so forth. Hope it's an awesome, awesome adventure there. And I um, just want to say thank you too for being willing in the in the big picture of this story to take all these these risks. That, you know, the break with you know, there's kind of underlying themes that sometimes we put words to it, and sometimes it just kind of is there. But the bravery that it took to take this path, and also the bravery to then speak up about it. Um, there's people that do take this path and say, "I'm done with." With mythology as a worldview, but they feel the need for whatever reason to go kind of quietly into the night, and that's fine. It's everyone's path is different, but for you to take a public stance is is harder. It does take bravery, so I appreciate you being willing to to speak up about it, despite you know the knowing that there could be some pushback. So, um, thank you for being willing to be a public voice in this because we do we do need people who are you know in a good spot to be public about it to do to do so. So, thank you for being part of that too, and um, just thank you again. Thank you for your story. It's been great to get to know you. Of course. Yeah. I appreciate that so much. That makes me feel very good. And it reminds me, you know, this is why I wanted to do this. It's very rewarding. Um, It's for myself, but it's also for everybody that may be watching. You know, I don't want anyone to feel alone or, you know, if they're going through what I went through, you know, I needed more of this. Like you said, you know, we need more stories like this. We need more openness and bravery and vulnerability like this. And, you know, I, this is my first time being on an interview really. And, um, everything you said about my potential book. Like I really appreciate it. It means a lot to me. And um, I really appreciate you letting me on here, coming on your channel. It's an awesome channel. And I love seeing the videos you make and the comments you get, um, seeing how it really impacts people. It's, it's a really good thing to be a part of. And I'm really thankful that, you know, you've given me that opportunity. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. Yeah. It's been a privilege to be able to hear people's stories and it's certainly, um, I love how everyone's got a unique, unique, journey there no one's no one's been just like me but um we're coming to hopefully some really good healthy conclusions and and kind of helping each other along with it so it's been such a blessing and a a privilege to be part of the you know of having a platform um but just want to say again everyone uh, we've been speaking with bell clark please uh go check out her blog when we're done the links beneath our video um check out her blog and connect with her and bell we're looking forward to all the great things that are going to come from all your efforts but thank you again for sharing your story today it's been great to get to know you Of course. Thank you so much. Thank you. Have a great day. You too. Bye-bye.